get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Quest Nutrition, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants. Bezos knows the, the personal trading space very well. Stop trading just time for dollars and shift from one to one client work to one to many, which you've done over and over again. Um, you can go to rise25.com, learn about us, and download your free dream product ladder. You can map out your business on one sheet of paper. And I'm looking forward to digging into this with Bedros. Today, we have Bedros Koulian, founder of Fit Body Boot Camps, currently the world's fastest growing fitness chain and listed as one of the Inc. 5000 fastest growing businesses. He is one of the go-to people in the fitness industry, and I know top people in all industries, Bejos, that go to you for advice, and it's because you've helped so many business owners go from you know, maybe struggling to six figures to seven figures and beyond, and what's interesting about your story is you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You, know, you had to fight through adversity to get to where you're at, and uh, as a child, you know, you immigrated to America, spoke no English, your family scraped by, and at one point I read you were even living out of your 1979 Toyota pickup truck, and you definitely have the immigrant edge. I want to make sure also we will talk about the book Man Up, Cut Your Bullshit and Dominate Your Path. Bejos, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Jeremy. I appreciate this opportunity. So your dad had three jobs when he came here. What was he doing? Uh, So when we escaped Soviet Union and came to the United States, my dad delivered newspapers, uh, literally by the second day. Uh, So on June 16th, 1980, we entered the United States. On June 17th, he was delivering newspapers. Uh, Within a couple days after that, he was delivering newspapers, washing dishes at a pizzeria, and pumping gas at a gas station. And uh, this is how he got us to stay in a tiny little room that some guy rented to us, a family of five in one bedroom. And we were eternally grateful to that guy without him and introducing my dad to the paper delivery route. uh, We probably would have been homeless the moment we arrived here. What was it like like? as a little kid coming over here? What were you thinking? I don't know if you remember. I I, I do. And... When you're with your parents, see, it was different for my brother and sister. My brother's 14 years older than me. My sister's 16 years older than me. I'm, at the time, I was six years old. And when you're six years old, like, just like my, my daughter and son, they're 11 and 9. Anywhere that me and my wife go, as long as they're with us, they feel safe. They're, mm. they're, they're safe. So I didn't have the fears of we're going to a new country or we're escaping an old country. I didn't know we were escaping. I didn't know we were escaping into Italy. I didn't know this building that we went into once we were in Italy was called the American Consul, and that we were pleading our case so that we can be political refugees and not get sent back where my dad would end up getting shipped mm. to Siberia. You had to go to Armenia and, to Italy and then to U.S. Yes, exactly. And people go, why that route? Because remember, Armenia was a part of the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union was okay with Italy. It was not okay with the United States. So we were able to go on vacation, if you know what I mean, um, to Italy. And then from there, we were able to make do the great escape. Wow. And so as long as you're with your parents, when you're six years old, you're fine, even to the point where when we got here, and you know, my dad worked all these odd jobs, my older brother and sister worked all these odd jobs, but their job was to pay the rent to that one bedroom apartment, to uh, make sure that we paid our share of the electric and water bill and gas bill. And so I became the breadwinner. And people ask me, what do you, how, did, how does a six year old become the breadwinner? My dad had discovered during his paper route that uh, (laughs) grocery stores have these dumpsters and they throw away food that's expired or maybe has gone bad but isn't fully rotten. And my dad at night would take me to these dumpsters and he'd give me a boost into them. And my job was to scavenge that and get the food that was expired but not rotten and hand it over to my mom and dad. Now, to me, that was a treasure hunt, right? So I feel safe. I'm with my parents. Um, You know, they make sure that I'm fed. 
uh, they, they're putting me on these great adventures, a treasure hunt. Here, get that. No, put that down. Pick that up instead. No, get the milk. No, pick up the cheese. It talk was about, fine. Talk about resourceful. Yeah, like yeah. And it was fine until later that spring. Because remember, we got here in June. In September, I had to go to kindergarten. And that's when it hit me. I do not know the language. I don't understand the culture. Uh, the kids don't like me. I dress funny. I got a funny haircut. Um, and, and that's when I started to get teased. We moved from apartment to apartment. So I've been to three elementary schools, two junior highs, two high schools. Um, yeah. Kids can be cruel, I, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's okay and all. But man, I remember, let's see, first grade running away from the principal. Principal's chasing me down the street one way. They had called my mom, and my mom was chasing me another way, another way, another way, way. This is first grade now. I bar I'm barely speaking English. And I found a broken glass in the gutter, and I picked it up, and I said, if either one of you come any closer to me, I'm going to cut myself. Wow. And, wow. you know, I guess some people call that traumatic. And let me tell you, I've gone through a lot of therapy, by the way, in the last two years. I finally decided to seek out therapy for all the weird shit that the dark I was going to say, on. like, how that's affected you today, but yeah. Yeah. Oh, is my mic? The guys want to fix my mic. Sorry. That's cool. Um, yeah, no worries. So really, it, it's the weirdest thing, man, when when you realize, like, I'd rather end my life as a kid than go back to school and get teased, right? Yeah. And so I was, one, I'd get excited when we would leave a different school and I'd go to a new one. However, on the flip side, now I got to make friends again. And so I developed this weird ability to build a rapport very quickly because I didn't know how long to. I was going to be in town yeah. and how long you and I were going to be friends. Wow. You have to do that. Um, yeah. That is wild, Bedros. Thanks for sharing that. Those are, you know, tough times. Um, what? Take me back to the time you were living out of your truck. What was going on at that, at that point? Ah, yes. That was a circumstance of just going broke, meaning um, the thing I always share with people is – I. When we came to America, we were poor and broke. Poor is a state of mind. Mm. You know, people who live in poverty, scarcity mindedness, broke. Donald Trump went broke. If you read his books, he went broke when he owed a lot of money to banks and went and renegotiated his debt. I make a lot of money right now, but if I can make one or two bad decisions, I might be broke, but I'll never be poor again. And so, sorry, what was your question it's where that a, was concerned? Where you were at when you were living out of your truck. Yeah. And so I went broke because I made a bad business decision, the very first business I launched on the internet called TotalMuscle.com. It was an online supplement site in 1997. Sounds like and a in great domain. Yeah, it is, and I, and I still have that domain name. Oh, and no. so, <laughs> but I saw nothing on it. But um, it's more like nostalgia that I keep it. But um, there was no Facebook to run ads on. There was no Google to be found on. There was no YouTube to do product how-tos. And so I was buying supplements and I thought I could one up the supplement stores and sell them on the internet, no overhead. But I realized these things expire faster than I can sell them. And so I maxed out my credit cards, went broke and ended up living out of my Toyota pickup for a few months until I got back on my feet. But that was really also the greatest lesson, not only in adversity being a strong um, Adversity being an advantage, meaning I look at adversity as just like when I go to the gym and I lift weights to build my muscles, I look at adversity as resistance to build my mental, emotional, and entrepreneurial muscles. So that was my first adversity lesson there. The other thing was never sell things that expire. Well, at least for me, I don't sell things that expire. I sell things that are that's informational. I don't have to store and ship. You were ahead of your time then. I was too far ahead of my time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with I love what you said. You know, watching anyone who hasn't checked out your your videos that you have on YouTube and on your site need to check them out. You talk at one point about contrast, and at that point, because you can reframe anything with the contrast. We talk a little about that and how you, no matter what the situation is now, how your thought process goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, a, a great example of that is. Again, funny, when you're with your mom and dad as a kid, you're not scared. But thinking back, once they told me what was happening in the old country, so about six months before we left, escaped Armenia, uh, at nighttime, there was a knock on the door at our house in Armenia. Well, it was an apartment because no one's allowed to own anything. So you just live in communist living. And uh, there was a knock. My dad opened the door. Two men in suits came in and they asked us all to line up along the hallway, along the, along the wall, shoulders against the wall. We did. I was probably five and a half years old. And uh, 
they were looking around our house and my dad was talking to them. He didn't seem scared, but he was more like negotiating with them. Uh, but again, I felt safe. Brother, sister, mom and dad are all around me. Well, in that moment, what I didn't realize is they had gotten wind that we were trying to escape and they were looking for evidence. It was the KGB, wow. right? It was the, Holy the cow. KGB. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to have to go to therapy after listening to this, Pedro. Dude, so, geez. I, I, I had disassociated myself from so much stuff. And here's a funny thing. I know I'm deviating a little bit, but Deviate about as three much years as you want. Yeah. Three years ago, Jeremy, I went to a therapist because I was having severe anxiety attacks. And I, I went for that reason. And he taught me a few things. He taught me halt. For example, halt means hungry, angry, lonely, tired. And when you're halting, an alcoholic is likely to go hit the bottle. A drug addict is likely to go uh, start you know, snorting cocaine or whatever, right? And so I would go through these stages of I'm just going to work. I'm not going to get up and go pee. I'm not going to drink water. I'm just going to work and clear out my work inbox or whatever. Your drug. It was. And so I went to a therapist and I said, hey, I need help with this. And he taught me those solutions. And within months, I was not having anxiety attacks. And wow. he goes, well, we're done. But is there anything else you want to talk about? And I said, well, you know, I had a weird childhood. You want to explore that? And this is where all this stuff that I'm talking about, the KGB coming to our house and me dumpster diving and having my hair washed with gasoline because we couldn't afford lice treatment wow. when we came to this country. And I had lice as a kid. Jeez. All those things, traumatic events that I didn't realize were really screwing with my operating system, right? So you want to talk about... It's like your subconscious. It was affecting your subconscious. Yes. And your subconscious, as we all know, influences all of your actions, right? And so I was gung-ho on creating security and safety and all these businesses and all this income. But truth be told, it was starting to affect my relationship with my wife. I thought I was doing the right thing because I never wanted to be poor and right. broke and desperate again. Yeah. So the pendulum had swung so far that way that I was neglecting my relationship for the sake of financial security. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. It does now to me too, right? You're a doctor, so of course it makes sense to you. <laughs> Not that kind <laughs> of doctor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I, to be truthful, I'm a yeah. bit of a Neanderthal, so it really takes someone to explain things to me to, to get it. And once Kevin, my therapist, explained it, I was like, holy smokes. I mean, I'm trying to create security, yet I'm creating insecurity. Uh, I've got financial security now, yeah. but I've got insecurity in my family, right? So I went and started to fix that as well. And, and today I'm so thankful. I live an awesome life. I'm blessed. I'm fortunate. But with that said, I always use the contrast. Because I know what it's like having the KGB knock on your door and, and at will look around and possibly take your mom or dad away, when the economy crashed in 2008 and I was in the process of launching Fit Body Boot Camp, that adversity was nothing compared to the KGB trying to take mom and dad away. And so I had that contrast where I go, oh, the economy crashed, no big deal. I'll, I reframe it as I'll have less competition and uh, I can find employees for, for less pay. Instead of saying, oh my God, the economy crashed, I guess I should lay down and die as well. So that's kind of how my mindset's yeah. always been programmed. Yeah, I wanted you to touch on that because it's so powerful that that contrast and the reframe, and anyone you know can do that. I mean, even you could do it with someone else. Like, look at that person who has, you know, whatever, no legs, and I can be, you know, you can be grateful. And, and the other thing you talk about in one of the videos too is about just I love when you talk about appreciation and you start your day with appreciation. Um, yeah. So, when did you start that, and why? Well, okay. Do you know who Craig Ballantyne is by chance? I was gonna, you know, I have this here um, because I want to talk about your Man oh. Up book, and I have uh, oh. Craig's Craig's oh, whole right. box here. So I want to talk about yes. Right. Then you know who Craig is. Yes. So, so Craig is. I call him the most disciplined man on the planet, and I was very undisciplined. And so, Craig, before the Perfect Day formula was ever written, I was the test guinea pig through environmental exposure, learning through Craig because we were. He was a, a client of mine who later became a business partner. And today we're dear friends and business partners. And so through environmental exposure, you know, I would laugh at him. Why do you want to have dinner at 5 p.m., man? We should be like, this is like a late lunch. And then what, we have dinner at 8 or 9. He goes, no, by 8 or 9, I'm asleep because I'm planning for my morning. I'm like, planning for your morning? Come on. The party's just starting. But I've slowly become more disciplined because of him. Uh, but, but, but the whole, whole, whole thing here that y your question With was. The appreciation. I, I like, the appreciation. Appreciation. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things he went to teach me was you got to meditate first thing in the morning and get centered. 
And Jeremy, I tried. I tried, but I quickly realized meditation was not for me. Yeah. As you can see, I've got the attention span I'm of sort a hummingbird. I'm sort of with you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's not for everybody, right? Yeah. It's, it's just not. So I said, all right, but if it's about getting centered and learning that as an entrepreneur, there's always bad things happening in our lives because that's the job we chose. You know, the Federal Trade Commission is going to put me through an audit a couple times a year because I'm a franchise. That's just normal. That's 7-Eleven, Subway, they all go through that. So do I. Um, whatever. Competition is going to creep up. But as an entrepreneur, we could always focus on the negative. But if meditation is designed to center me and get me to focus on the positive first thing in the morning, what else can I do that doesn't involve sitting there in silence? Right. For me, it was simple. I wake up and I go, what am I grateful for? I started going through a process of gratitude. So it's a three steps. What am I grateful for today? Three things I'm grateful for. It could be the fact that I live in Southern California, that I've got uh, a, a beautiful property with lots of elbow room, and the fact that I've got a family who loves me and cares for me. All right, now what are, who are three people I'm grateful for? And I'll just go through in my mind yeah. the three people that I'm grateful for. And then the last thing I do is I'll text those three yeah. people, a, just a text message, like if I'm texting you, hey, Jeremy, thank you so much for what you do. Your podcast has helped me and so many others like me. Keep fighting the good fight. Have an awesome Monday, B. Yeah. And it's a surprise to you. And you're like, everyone always says that was unexpected and came right at the right time. No one's ever said, how dare you send me a gratitude. <laughs> That's horrible of you. Yeah. And when people go, thank you so much, that feels great. It's the most selfish thing I can do, Jeremy, when, when people are patting me on the back saying what a great guy I am for sending them that. It really starts off my day with gratitude and mm. the fact that, Comes you know, back I'm a you. superhero. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So it's the most selfish thing I do, but it grounds me and then yeah. teaches me appreciation. Yeah. And one thing, you know, I notice you talk about a lot is leadership. And so I do want to talk about man up and man up, cut your bullshit and dominate your path. So first, how'd you come up with that, uh, that title? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a strong title. The reality is I am the anti guru guru. So uh, I will tell you all the, you know, I, I'm the guy that has a therapist. I failed at more businesses than I've been successful at. It's just I keep getting up and fighting. Uh, I am not college educated. All of my emails and blog posts have spelling errors in it. And I'm a bit rough around the edges, but I'm as transparent and authentic as they come because I figure if you're paying me, you deserve to know who you're dealing with. And so the truth of the matter is I was a horrible entrepreneur and simply made money from 2003, once I got on the internet in 2003, from 2003 to 2014, I made money by simply force of will, a uh, hustle and grind 10x, right? You can only do that for so long before your business grows and the bottom falls out because you've got a foundation that's crooked. And so my employees hated me, I hated them. My business partners hated me, I hated them. My clients hated me, I hated them. And to me, they were all the problem. My employees, my business partners, and my clients and customers. I had a vision of what I wanted in my head. I was unable to communicate that to anyone. It wasn't until 2014 that I decided to man up. And mm. really, when I think of the word man up, and the way I write it in the book, man up means to cut your excuses, mm. right? Cut your excuses, seize the opportunity, and reach your fullest potential. And so I had to cut my excuses and I had to say, I'm the problem. I am an indecisive leader. I come to work one day telling my team, we're going to focus on growing the franchise. The next day I go, hey, well, I've got a new business partner. We're going to grow this new info product. What does my team look at? How do they look at me in that moment? They go, this guy's so indecisive. I better go out and get another job. There's that one foot out the door. So a great leader, the way I write it in, in Man Up is when you man up, you are a decisive person. You have clarity in your vision, where your business is going, when it's gonna get there, and what you need to do to get there. And then you've hired a team of fighter jets and not crop dusters. And fighter jets are people who are, see, I call it a team. Back then I had employees. Employees clock in, clock out, do the bare minimum, and call it a day. Right. A team is a group of people who are playing a sport with the, out, with the desire to win. I've got a team here and they are playing with a desire for us to create 2,500 Fit Body Bootcamp locations worldwide and to have 1,500 coaching clients worldwide. And that is how I will be able to touch millions of people through our franchises and coaching business. I'm so clear on my vision. I'm very decisive. I communicate better than I ever have. And I create a, a culture of team members 
who are fighter jets and not crop dusters. For that to happen, I have to sleep early, wake up early, dominate my mornings, lead from the front, and the moment I screw up, then I've set the bar too low for them, they start screwing up as well. So what caused that awakening in 2014? I had an anxiety attack, and I, I write about it in the book. I had an anxiety attack so big. Uh, dude, my, my throat was closing up. I had tunnel vision. Both arms were tingling. Jeez. And I remember thinking, I think this is a heart attack. I'm 38 years old. I'm 43 now. I'm 38 years old, and I'm in my guest house. Again, I had a nice house, but it was through sheer will that I earned the money to buy it. And I'm in my guest house. I'm going to die this morning from a heart attack. My wife's not going to find me until later tonight when I'm just bloated and stiff. That's the last memory she's going to have of her husband, right? And so I said, all I have to do is I need to stumble down the staircase so that she can find me and maybe rescue me. And as I stumble down the staircase, I get a breath of fresh air. I don't know what caused the anxiety to go away, but it wasn't a heart attack. It all of a sudden just went away, and I was left as a sweaty mess. My heart was still beating fast, but... My hearing came back to normal, my vision, the tingling went away, my throat wasn't closing up, and I go, holy shit, I think I just avoided a heart attack. The next day, I went to the doctor, and they put you through the whole stress test yeah. and all that stuff, and, and he goes, you didn't have a heart attack, man. You had a massive anxiety attack, but if you keep this up, you will have a heart attack, Jeez. and best case scenario, you'll be in the, in the hospital. Worst case scenario, you'll be in the grave, and that's when I decided I need to man up, otherwise, my whole life's going to crumble. I'm not going to have a family. I'm not going to have a business and I might be dead. And in 2014, I said those five words, I need to man up. And I, the journey began. It was a two and a half, three year journey to be a, a fully manned up entrepreneur to become who I am today. Where do you turn to in that situation? Do you, do you turn to a group? Do you turn to a mentor? The answer is yes. So I turned to Joe Polish in the Genius Network Group and I rejoined Genius Network Group. Um, and I'm still in it today. I turned to Craig Ballantyne, right? The most disciplined man on the world. You know, I was teaching him sales and marketing. I said, now I need you to teach me how to have structure in my day. I mean, my phone would ring and I'd pick it up. I'd get a text and I'd pick it up. But if it's not a scheduled phone call or a text, I shouldn't be responding. Yeah. And so he taught me discipline and structure and, and Joe Polish and his team taught me scaling my business and being saying no is okay so that I can say yes to better opportunities. Um, I felt like if, if you came to me with an opportunity and I said no, that I'm letting you down and that I'm a weak entrepreneur. So I would take on all these opportunities, but then I would deliver a shitty service as a business partner and then you'd go like, what happened? And so I got a therapist, right? I mean, the list goes on. It's, it's mentors, it's friends who take good care of me. It's parting away from people who wanted to go tailgating uh, on, a, on a Sunday night tailgate and concert and then Monday morning I'd wake up foggy headed wondering what happened to me So I had to cut out the crabs in my life surround myself with better people Get coaching from the people that I wanted to be like see a therapist and work through my shit And so it was a two and a half three year journey man, but I, it's I an went ongoing through it and I, journey. Yeah, it's a continuous it journey. Is. Yeah It continues and I should have done it sooner. I regret not doing it sooner so, Bedros, what will people get with Man Up? Like, I see this amazing package, right? I, I brought this because I know you're good friends with Craig, and you get this this perfect day formula yeah. box and book and workbook. So, I'm curious of Man Up. What are people going to get? Yeah, it, Man Up is real simple, man. It, it is going to be a book. And, and listen, uh, I'm going to preface this by saying I've helped New York Times bestselling authors become New York Times bestselling authors by orchestrating their product launch, writing their right. video script for their free plus shipping offer. So I have, in fact, my wife's book is free plus shipping and she sold 22,000 of it. Wow. I refuse to be a New York Times bestselling author that way. I'm going to be a New York Times bestselling author with the help of you and your audience and the network that I've created and helped and I will continue to serve over the next 12 months because it's just one simple book, 51,000 words, and that book covers the three things that every entrepreneur is missing to reach their fullest potential, which is becoming an effective leader, having clear vision on their business, and a strong team. And so I teach leadership. I teach developing your vision and building a strong team behind you because you can't do it all yourself so that you can reach your fullest potential. That's what Man Up is. Yeah, love it. Yeah, so we'll definitely make sure we link it up. And so people can get it. Is there going to be an audio version or just a print version? 
Yes, there will be an audio version, okay. and I will be the one doing the audio because that's what people ask the most. And I go nuts when I get excited. So uh, if you haven't <laughs> noticed, I yeah. love it. Talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the journey of the franchise um, because you said in the beginning with the tank of the economy, things were affected. What were the systems like then, and, and talk about them them now. Oh my gosh. Well, you know, let me tell you first and foremost, I got to tell you that when I started Fit Body Bootcamp um, in 2000 and uh, I'm sorry, in 2010, it was a licensing model. And I feel bad. And I know a lot of my franchisees are watching this now. I feel bad for them because they just got 10 DVDs in the mail and good luck. Today, we've it's evolved just in seven years from a license model to a franchise, a legitimate franchise. We have a four day university in-house business coaches that you can call and email anytime. We make your website, do your marketing for you. I mean, literally, as long as you deliver the service, which we teach you how to deliver, you will grow a business that's successful, profitable, and scalable. And so, but for that to happen, again, leadership is always the problem. Leadership is always the solution. I had to man up and become a better leader. And when I did, I decided who are the best franchises out there in my space and what are they doing? And I said, I'm going to do it better. So we deliver all the marketing. We send them the leads, our franchisees. Uh, and these systems took time to build. Right, right? yeah, for it, sure. It took time to build, but I invested in, if, if I knew that um, a particular brand out there, company out there had a great HR manager, I was, on, uh, I was on LinkedIn trying to find that HR manager and bring them in here. So all of a sudden, I wasn't trying to develop You're recruiting the talent. Manager. I was recruiting the talent, and that helped me time collapse. Wow. And that's the best thing, the best te thing I can teach right now is recruit the talent if you can, because you time collapse rather than trying to train somebody up into a role that you will later realize they don't fit into. Yes. And so, it, once I did all that, recruited the talent, created the systems that Fit Body Bootcamp is today, we became very quickly became a uh, entrepreneur's uh, 500 fastest growing franchises, and then Inc. Magazines. Um, number 2006 on the Inc. 5000 list and just very blessed and thankful, man, that that happened. Yeah. I'm going to give a shout out to a friend, Ed O'Keefe, with his book, Time Collapsing, too. Yes. Uh, yeah, I love Ed O'Keefe. Because he said time collapse. Uh, amazing book. Uh, amazing entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, you can pick and choose because it also, I mean, it has to do with the systems, but people have to implement those things. So is there a criteria that you look for? Because you've coached thousands, maybe tens of thousands of personal trainers to set up their own studio, you know, in their own yeah. systems before you did the franchise. So what do you look for? What's the criteria? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, and actually, we only take on 2% uh, of the applicants who apply. Because yeah. you and get so blamed we, in the end, you know, like you take someone that's on. It. Yeah. You, you bring, here's what happens, man. You bring on someone, someone on board to a franchise and they decide that, for example, Fit Body Bootcamp, we don't have juice bars, we don't have barbells, and we don't have kids care, we don't have uh, uh, showers. If I don't do my job right and we bring on someone who doesn't want to comply, which is why in the next room right behind me, we have a compliance officer. Yeah. His whole job is to make sure our franchisees who want to run a business like I'm selling yeah. actually comply because if they don't, they blame me. Then if they shut down, if too many of them shut down, the Federal Trade Commission goes, if you're wondering, by the way, why Cold Stone Creamery and Quiznos is not growing anymore, the Federal Trade Commission will not allow them to open up more franchises. Really? Yes, because uh, if you exceed a certain percentage of failure to launch is what they call it. And so I can't have failure to launch. So we put people through a rigorous, they fill out an application online. If they financially are qualified and if they have a fitness background, then we'll take them into consideration. They talk to a franchise business advisor. If they still make it through, then we have a discovery day where they come here and sit with me and our vice president of operations, seven people at a time, seven to one. Um, discovery day goes well. I set my expectations. Great. Fantastic. Then they sign our franchise agreement, our FA, and then they come to a four-day university as a new owner. That four-day university is an indoctrination process on how we do business, how we don't do business, why we offer refunds, 12-month unconditional money-back guarantee, instead of saying, no, Mrs. Jones, you don't get a refund, and then now we have a bad Yelp review. And finally, we coach them every step of the way to open, and when the good idea fairy comes to them and says, you should open up a juice bar, a <laughs> club, a shower, right. we go, anytime you think you have a good idea, call us, and we'll let you know if it's a good idea. But by doing that- It's an auto-recorded message that says no. 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just hit, hit number one. No, <laughs> right. right? Yeah, but but I'm telling you, man, I wish someone would have done that to me as an entrepreneur. Yeah, that said, hey, to be an entrepreneur, you have You're to be a strong leader. You're implementing almost what you wish you had, in a sense. That's it. All I'm giving my my franchisees is what I wish I had when I started my five gyms back in the day, and it cost me so much time, effort, and money. Have there been any yeses with people having good ideas and actually implementing, or no? Oh, absolutely. There man. have been. In okay. fact, yeah, yeah, we 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 have uh, several locations out there that owners are just badasses, fighter jets, fighter jets to the core, and they go, hey, here's how we're onboarding people. We're onboarding them online now. We're not closing them face to face like clients. And so we're now implementing their onboarding process here. And I love that I don't have a adversarial relationship. I've got a friendly relationship with my franchisees. And the reason for that is I don't charge a percentage of the gross revenue that they make. I take a flat fee every month. Mm. It's like 700 bucks. So they want to grow so, as much as possible and they're not going to become uh, you know, mad or – yeah. Exactly. And I saw when I did my research that the most successful franchises out there were percentaging you to death. 8% royalties here, 1% marketing fees. And before you know it, you have an adversary relationship. I have a friendly relationship. My franchisees open up more locations, which I'm okay with. and I'm very okay with. I'd rather have 2,500 locations with 800 owners 100%. than 2,500. Yeah. And so because we have a great relationship, they tell me what's working for them. And now we keep putting that back into the system and the system grows faster than I could ever grow it on my own. Yeah, and I think I've heard you say, you know, you kind of go against the grain in certain respects with with franchise, yeah. and that that's an example of that. How did you even decide, I mean, because you would think, oh, you follow the normal path and you take a percentage of it. What made you go yeah. against the grain on that, and then what else did you go against the grain on? I blame Tony Robbins on that, and oh. here's why. Uh, again, I am not the smartest person ever, but, I'm very coachable. Like, Jeremy, if you're like, B, do this and you'll sleep better, make more money, have a better relationship, I go, yes, sir, and I do it because you're trusted. You're friends with people I'm friends with, that's all I need to know. Because uh, I know I'm a knuckle-dragging Neanderthal. So where that's concerned, Tony Robbins, who I loved reading his books and stuff, he said, watch what everybody else is doing, and this was like in 2002. Watch what everybody else is doing and do the opposite. I just do that in everything now because I know the masses are wrong because I trust right. Tony Robbins and I've never even met the guy. Like I'm a big fan and I will, hopefully one day I'll, I'll get to shake his hand. But um, so I said, well, what is the franchise industry doing? And are the franchisees friends with the franchisor? And I quickly realized they're not. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? And they told me when I'm making 20 grand a month, the 6% is $1,200 mm -hmm. franchise fee. When I'm making 30 grand a month, the 6% is $1,500 a month franchise fee. And I don't like that. I said, great, we're gonna be the anti-franchise franchise. I'm gonna do the Tony Robbins things and do the opposite. My franchising attorney hated that idea. I went against the grain against his advice because I said, well, if you think this is how it should be, I'm gonna go against the grain. And every time I do, we've grown faster, we've had more impact, and we continue to make more money. What else have you gone against the grain besides the franchise oh, fee? My gosh. Um, well, coaching, for example, I and, and I love Dan Kennedy. Let me just preface this by saying I'm a big Dan Kennedy follower, disciple, and I love how he sells. And I believe we should all put money in people's pockets and set it on fire. That's a Dan Kennedy line, and that's a brilliant marketing strategy. Having said that, he believes in selling you his one-year mastermind paid in full. You're locked in. I look at it as you're not locked in. You can pay month to month, and if I don't deliver the service, you can leave. The way I look at it is, if I lock you in and you don't like the service I'm delivering on my coaching programs, you're going to run my name through the mud and I'm going to have such bad reputation. And so again, Dan Kennedy, who was the coaching and mastermind king, I said, you know what? The internet is going to level the playing fields here where people can just slam me if I don't do my job. How about I do my job, you pay me monthly, and if I don't do my job, you leave. So that was another big, my masterminds generate me multiple seven figures and I went against the grain and I've never regretted that. Yeah. So, Beatrice, I want to talk on that point for a second. You know, at Rise 25, we find that the highly successful businesses in any industry have a well flushed out product ladder, you know, of different offerings at different price points to serve people where they're at. And you are a master at this. Okay. So, I want you to talk about the different offerings you have available, like from the entry level to, to the highest level. Sure. Sure. In fact, I shared this in 2010 at Yannick's um, underground event. And. And I actually became the, uh, what do you call it, the speaker of the year or yeah, whatever he calls yeah. it. 
I shared our whole funnel there. And I called it the machine. And so everybody comes on board through the free content that I give. It's either on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, or my blog, right? They get onto my email list. And today we collect their phone numbers as well because we use Scipio to text them motivational, inspirational stuff. We never sell them with text. We sell them via email, but we deepen our relationship with them via text message because that's a very personal way of communicating. And so that's thing number one. As soon as I've got their contact info, the indoctrination process begins. I begin to get them to fall in love with me. And if you go to bedroskulian.com and opt in or ptpower.com and opt in, you'll see well before whatever you opt in for, we send you. But then the indoctrination prog pro process begins where I'm telling you my story, my hero story, the hero's journey, my purpose, my mission, and then start making you offers. By the time I'm making you offers, you and I are connected. And the products are usually in the $49 to $99 range, the first offers I make. From there, we go right to the multi-hundred dollar offers and continuity, like Fitness Business Ignition, Fit Pro Newsletter. Um, these are $99 a month programs that I've got literally thousands of clients on board. Once you're there and pay me continuity, that means you trust me more. See, I look at, when, you're a customer when you pay me once, when you buy a closed clients, one of my info products for 49 bucks or whatever it is. You're a client when you agree to pay me on a reoccurring basis, you trust me. We, uh, what is it, 800,000 people or 800 million people trust Netflix enough to pay them on a continuity basis. Right. I've got thousands of fitness people to pay me continuity, they trust me. Now I'm ready to move you into a live event where I'm gonna either sell you coaching or to Fit Body Bootcamp franchise application where I'm gonna sell you a franchise if you're a good fit. And that's my ascension ladder. But every step of the way, I look at it as a 10 to one ratio. For every dollar you give me, I've gotta give you 10 back. Yeah. And so- You wanna provide got, that value, yeah. Mm -hmm. So because of that, High Tech Trainer, one of my software products, which was making me 20 grand a year or 20 grand a month, I shut it down because we had a high attrition level and it was not meeting my clients' expectations. Mm. Uh, Fitness Marketing Manifesto, a $99 a month physical newsletter, was making us $12,000 a month. Nothing to write home about, but still good money. Yeah, I shut it down because I wasn't able to create content fast enough to fulfill it. Um, I was promising a unicorn, delivering a donkey. Uh, a medical referral manual, basically how trainers can get referrals from doctors. Um, the guy that I partnered with, he meant well, but the content was not deep, it was shallow, people weren't getting results, refund rates were high, I shut it down. Because like Warren Buffett says, it takes you 20 years to build reputation and 20 seconds to ruin it. Right. And so every step of the way that I'm ascending people up the machine, if I can't over deliver, then I'll unplug the product. Bezos, I know you have another session in three minutes, so I just want to point people towards where they should check out more, and I urge anyone to get man up. I'm going to get the, the audio version whenever it comes out on Audible or wherever. Um, get man up, cut your bullshit, dominate your path. Where should we point people towards um, online? Uh, good question. Either any of my social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, just Bedros Koulian, or my blog, BedrosKoulian.com. Right, Bedros, it's Koulian, K-E-U-I-L-I-A-N. Bedros, it's been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate you, your time, and, and thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. If there's anything I could do for you, just reach out to me. Will do. Thank you. See ya. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand.